This video will be discussing elements of spiritual abuse. Please watch at your own discretion. Spiritual abuse can be described as the experience of a person attempting to use spiritual or religious beliefs as a way to exercise power and dominance over their followers or individual who is in the romantic relationship. I find spiritual abuse to be particularly toxic because it takes what research shows could be an otherwise positive experience in a person's life, the experience of having faith or religious or spiritual beliefs and using that same aspect to turn it against a person. The other aspect of spiritual abuse that can be rather daunting as well as difficult to recognize is that many times the tactics that a manipulative or power hungry person uses can fly under the radar. So in essence, spiritual abuse can in many ways be a sneaky manipulation tactic. Today, I'm going to be sharing with you 14 very sneaky ways that spiritual abuse can manifest itself. Stay tuned because I'm about to break it all down. And welcome to my channel or welcome back to my channel if you're returning either way I'm always happy that you're here I'm Rachel Ann I'm a licensed professional counselor and I make videos of psychological commentary on current events anti-scam and I have a particular interest in high control high demand cultic groups if this sounds like something that you're into make sure you subscribe so you don't miss any future videos one quick disclaimer is that this video is for educational and commentary purposes only. I'm not intending to diagnose or treat, just provide you with some education that hopefully can be helpful and useful to you wherever you are in your life journey. Spiritual abuse can show up really in any relational dynamic, whether it is your romantic relationship or whether you are part of some kind of organized religious group. As I've already shared, research does indicate that having some kind of belief in something greater than yourself does and has been shown to help a person have a higher level of subjective well-being. But this very same belief that can be very powerful and even healing in some respects for a person can also be used against that very person. So the first sign of spiritual abuse that can be very sneaky is if someone tells you, quote, God told me X, Y, and Z, end quote. The reason that this particular statement where somebody really postures as if they have a direct line of communication with God or a higher power is that it's the ultimate trump card. It basically trumps any objections that a believer would have because at the end of the day, the spiritual leader or person who is engaging in the manipulation or spiritual abuse essentially knows that they're dealing with someone who really maybe wants to believe in something or is seeking guidance. And so by swooping in and saying that they have a direct line of communication with God for the sake of this video, by the way, I am going to be phrasing a lot of this in terms of Christianity. So using God as the example of higher power, because I have just seen this come up time and time again. By telling the believer that God instructed the leader or the head of household, if you well that they are supposed to do something it really removes the ability in many cases for the victim of spiritual abuse to come up with any objections what are you supposed to say in return to someone who says god told me that we need to do this or god told me that you need to do that it really becomes a tool for silencing survivors and individuals in that belief system because to challenge that leader or the partner in the relationship would in essence almost be to challenge that person's faith and if you are going up against a spiritual leader a religious leader that is is the last thing that a follower would necessarily want to do. They're coming to that person for guidance. And so naturally, by using that good old phrase, well, God told me that you need to do this or do that, it is a great way to silence what that follower really wants to see happen or, or just silence them in general. 
The second sneaky sign of spiritual abuse is when someone tells you that you're not living in accordance with biblical teachings or prophecy. Now, each faith system does have a specific set of beliefs that they believe that people are supposed to behave in, to be Christ-like, but in a spiritually abusive setting, this very statement will be thrown back at the victim in an effort to control their behavior. So if someone is buying into and following and believing, then typically this means that they do want to go in accordance with spiritual guidance, with what the religious doctrine says. And so by telling someone you're not living in accordance with our doctrine, it can end up shaming that person. And I have seen this come up across the board. It could be for seemingly benign behaviors that a person is engaging in. And so maybe for women, they are wearing something that falls outside of what the doctrine says that the woman is supposed to wear, but the leader or the partner in the spiritually abusive relationship will then take it a step further to really double down on the fact that the individual is living outside of this doctrine when a lot of times the more that you get into fundamentalist groups and super conservative religious organizations, we come to find out that this doctrine is completely man-made, that scripture has been twisted to justify whatever it is that religious entity or organization wants to have rules around. And so you can imagine that in a one-on-one -on -one romantic relationship, this is a great phrase to also silence and suppress any kind of individuality. This can be told to kids. So maybe if you are watching and you grew up in an environment where there was spiritual abuse or religious abuse going on, this phrase may even bring something up for you and you may remember yourself being told that you were living out of accordance with God's will or the doctrine or whatever the case could be. The third sneaky sign of spiritual abuse is when a partner or when the religious organization stonewalls you or shuts down on you completely. Stonewalling is a form of emotional abuse in that the other person just refuses to communicate with you. They refuse to speak to you. A lot of times the victim really doesn't know what precipitated the stonewalling to occur. They just know that their organization is no longer speaking to them, that phone calls aren't being returned. And in many cases, this is done as a way to essentially excommunicate someone from the group. If it is a group setting, maybe that person has engaged in what the group considers to be completely abhorrent and not allowed. And it usually falls under one of the arbitrary rules that the group has set. But either way, it is also done to exert some kind of control over the victim's emotional status. So consider this, your romantic partner just all of a sudden refuses to communicate with you. You don't know why. Naturally, one of the first things that a person will start to do is second guessing themselves and saying, well, what did I do in this situation for my partner to stop talking to me? And this can be applied too to a larger religious organization. And so the victim is left engaging in self-blame, feeling low self-esteem, feeling very destabilized and unsettled because their group, their support system has essentially removed all support. Again, this is all about exerting power and control over someone's emotions. The fourth sneaky sign of spiritual abuse is if and when your past is weaponized. So maybe in confidence, you decided to be very vulnerable with a leader in the church or even your romantic partner and tell them about something that happened in your past. Maybe it was something that you have a lot of shame surrounding. Maybe it's something that you feel guilty for or that you just continue to struggle with and the religious or spiritually abusive individual will oftentimes use what you shared in that vulnerable moment and bring it right back up and throw it in your face 
at varying times. Oftentimes it's not an isolated incident. They bring it up repeatedly because their goal again is to exert that power and control over the individual. And if the individual is experiencing low self-esteem, a person who doesn't feel good about themselves naturally is easier to control. In addition to this, sometimes the past of a person is weaponized and used against them because then it creates and fosters a sense of dependency on the religious entity, spiritual group, or even the romantic partner in that they really tell the person how bad they are, how lost they are, how broken they are because they engaged in XYZ behaviors in that they need the group, they need the partner because they're going to be the guiding force in that person's life. This is a very interesting dynamic that can take place and it can elicit a range of emotions. So in the first respect, the person whose past is being weaponized and used against them can feel a lot of shame, a lot of self-doubt, a lot of insecurity. But on the other hand, the group is swooping in, the romantic partner is swooping in and saying, but don't worry, we have your back, we'll love you through this and we'll support you. You just need to follow what we're teaching or you just need to listen to my godly instruction and I'll show you the way. So then it's almost paired with the sense of relief that, oh wow, this person has forgiven me and they're going to show me the way. True forgiveness does not continue to weaponize a person's past or even ever bring up a person's past to begin with to make their partner, to make their group member feel badly about themselves. True unconditional love and caring that many romantic partners and religious organizations posture that they have really accepts a person for who they are, our imperfections, our flaws and all, our things about ourselves that maybe we know we could have done better with, but we were learning and growing, any decisions that you've made. That's what true unconditional love is. But the sneaky sign of spiritual abuse here is that oftentimes your past is weaponized and the love that the group shows you really isn't conditional. It's you have to do a number of activities or engage in beliefs or engage in meetings that the group offers or the religious entity offers in order to receive positive accolades and be fully accepted into the group. And even then, oftentimes acceptance is not really authentic. The fifth sneaky sign of spiritual abuse is a statement that can come out in varying ways, but the crux of it is that the spiritually abusive individual will tell their victim, oh, we don't believe in that, and so you shouldn't either. We don't dress like that, you shouldn't either. We don't think like that, you shouldn't either. What this does is, again, kind of go into making the believer feel like they don't have any other options. It's either go with the group or you're not a full believer. And many times these spiritually abusive organizations and leaders instill so much fear into a person that if they don't adhere to the doctrine of the group, then they will be damned to hell or they will lose their salvation or they will lose their place in the eternal heaven. And so this becomes a really tricky situation for the follower to be in because in a way their individuality, their individuality is suppressed because maybe they do have a different thought about something, but they are discouraged from expressing it. This again kind of supports Stephen Hassan's bite model in the emotional control and the thought control section. A lot of times this phrase is also used with kids who are raised in a certain religious doctrine or belief system in that there's no explanation given as to why the group believes in what it believes. Instead, it's an automatic, reflexive, thought-stopping cliche where kids are told, oh, we just don't believe in that. And so you don't need to believe in that either. Or we don't allow questions about that. Please don't ask us questions. And it just assists in suppressing any kind of critical thought, critical thinking 
And these groups very much want it to be the group herd mentality, that echo chamber, so that they can retain their members and continue to achieve their own goals, not necessarily what's in the best interest of the follower or the individual who's even in the romantic relationship where spiritual abuse is occurring. This next one happens to be one of my least favorite sneaky signs of spiritual abuse. And I have noticed that this happens where the person who is in a romantic relationship where there is spiritual abuse happening, or again, they're part of a religious group or entity where spiritual abuse is occurring, is often pushed to their emotional limit pushed to their breaking point and maybe they engage in becoming very exasperated, very frustrated. Maybe they even experience anger. In really severe cases, erratic behavior where they're making impulsive decisions and acting in a way that definitely the religious group or the spiritually abusive romantic partner does not condone at all. However, when an individual is pushed to their limit because a person in the human brain and our mind can only handle so much abuse before someone does start to behave in varying ways, whether somebody shuts down, they suppress their own emotions, or it goes on the opposite end of the spectrum where the individual who is being in that spiritually abusive dynamic starts acting what they consider to be acting out. So becoming really angry, becoming loud, a contrarian, if you will, then the group or the spiritually abusive partner will tell the victim that the devil has a hold of them or they're not believing enough and that's why they're experiencing all of these troubles. The reason that this one is so sneaky and insidious to me is that a lot of times by the time a person reaches this quote unquote breaking point and experiences an emotional breakdown, they are fairly indoctrinated in the relationship, in the religious or spiritual organization. And so it's hard for them to really recognize and even honor their own emotions. They just don't even know why they're reacting the way that they are reacting. And then to have this group swoop in or the romantic partner swoop in and say, the devil has a hold of you or you're in the wrong and you're not believing enough and that's why you're feeling like this. The person really engages in gaslighting of themselves and they really start to second guess pretty much everything that's going on. The next sign of spiritual abuse is that oftentimes these groups or of course a romantic partner who is spiritually abusive will very much offer what I consider to be pseudo support and this is all meant to foster a dependency on the group itself or the romantic partner. So they really, again, I like the word swoop in because that's what I, I think about when these situations happen. They swoop in and they tell the person that they're always going to be there for them. They're going to love them no matter what. And of course, it feels really good. It feels affirming. It feels validating. They may even say that the group forgives them or God forgives you. And it can feel like the victim's emotional proverbial bucket is being filled, so to speak. However, this support is often very contingent on how much the victim falls in line with what the group's doctrine is. I touched on this previously, so I won't get too much into it, but true unconditional support is when someone may tell you, hey, my feelings are hurt by what happened. I don't like how you handled the situation, but I still love you and I still accept you. I may just not really like you that much right now versus what these groups and what these romantic partners do is they pair in, we love you no matter what, Yet then you come to find out that they're encouraging you need to be at church every time the church door is open or you need to listen to everything that I'm saying because you've acted out of accordance and only I know the right way for your life. And this comes after that support has been given. And so the person, the victim is left really trying to jump through all of these hoops to feel back in the person's good graces and to feel as if they can continue to receive that support. Because the support in these spiritually abusive groups and romantic relationships 
it's often dangled like a carrot. It's offered and then it's withdrawn and then it's offered and withdrawn and so forth and so on. So it really creates this inconsistent, unstable environment where the victim never really knows exactly what is going on or what they're going to get. It creates that walking on eggshells effect. This eighth sign will probably not surprise you, and I've talked about it on my channel before, but it's when someone hides behind scripture and uses it to justify abusive acts, doctrine, rules, behaviors, whatever the case could be. Sometimes folks will say, this isn't my will, this is God's will for you. And I know that God told me, then they pair multiple sneaky signs of spiritual abuse all together, which really can insert confusion in the follower or in the person who is in a romantic relationship. We know, and if you've watched my channel, then you know that I've covered IBLP and Jehovah's Witnesses. We know that these groups absolutely create doctrine and they loosely interpret it and base it off of the Bible or scripture, but they twist it and it's all done in an effort to exert control over the followers, exert control over their victims. What other organizations have you noticed really do an expert job of twisting scripture and using it to exert control? I would love to hear your thoughts on that. Please feel free to share in the comments. Another sneaky sign of spiritual abuse that often occurs in spiritually abusive organizations or relationships is if you have shared a personal hardship or struggle that you're going through with someone and then that someone goes without your consent and shares it to other people in your life, so friends, family, or with other people in the spiritual organization without your consent. So this one boils all down to intent. What is the intent of the person who has shared your private information without your consent? In spiritually abusive organizations, oftentimes the intent is to make the sharer look good. It's not a genuine means to try to get you support or try to get you help. It is often something that maybe a spouse does regarding their partner to talk about how much of a difficult time they're going through, trying to support you with your hardship, with your struggle, but it's done in a very sneaky, manipulative way in order to elicit sympathy and attention for the abusive partner or or church member. So I think about somebody who's in a romantic relationship and their partner is emotionally, physically abusive, and then they take a struggle that their partner is having and they share it with the pastor of the church. And it's done in this image conscious way of painting the perpetrator as the supportive partner when in actuality, this person is creating a trail to demonstrate that their partner, the victim, is the one who's at, at fault for what's going on. Am I saying that it's bad for a partner or friend to reach out for support for you in a healthy respectful, genuinely concerned manner. Absolutely not. I just have to make that distinction very clear. But this particular tactic is often extremely manipulative because the person who has nefarious intent and is sharing private information, even twisting things. And if anybody questions the sharer, so if the victim questions and says, why would you share my personal information? The other person has an easy grounds to say, oh, you're being difficult again. I'm reaching out for help. I am the better partner or I am the more godly member of the church and so on and so forth. So as you can see, this one can be a little bit convoluted and complex and I really hope that it makes sense because this absolutely does come up and can wreak a lot of insecurity and self-doubt in the victim who is going through this particular situation. A lot of times narcissists expertly engage in these kinds of behaviors and it's all done to elicit a sort of emotional response 
from other people. They want to always be the victim. And so by telling other people what their romantic partner is going through and really spinning it out in a way that makes their partner look poorly really can elicit the sympathy and the attention that that person is so craving. Next sign is if a person is consistently told that it's their fault, that they're not working hard enough and they're not believing enough, they're not subscribing enough or attending enough services and that they are at fault for whatever is going on in their life. This is absolutely a very sneaky and sometimes not so sneaky sign of spiritual abuse that occurs. When somebody is constantly told, whether in an overt or covert way, so it could be right in your face or just very subtle, when someone is told that they are not doing enough, this creates a cycle of shame in constantly working and working and working to meet arbitrary expectations that either the spiritually abusive romantic partner has for their significant other or the expectations that the religious entity has for their followers. As you can imagine, this only reaps exhaustion. This helps to create an even bigger disconnect within the individual who's receiving the spiritual abuse because in their minds, they may be trying as hard as they can, but in these groups and relationships where spiritual abuse is present, it's never enough in their eyes. They are constantly blaming their victims in order to, in some cases, indoctrinate them even more and especially emotionally control them. In some cases, this then goes to the physical control aspect, which we see in organizations that have certain requirements of how frequently someone must participate in the organization's practices or services in order to remain in good standing. It, it really can go across the spectrum in terms of the different forms of control that a person is attempting to gain over the other person by shaming them and telling them that they are not doing enough. The 11th sign is if there are double standards present. This one comes up quite frequently, unfortunately, in romantic relationships where spiritual abuse is occurring. However, I don't want to discount the fact that it absolutely happens in religious entities, spiritual groups as well. So the leader of the group, the abusive partner may be allowed to engage in certain behaviors or do certain things, but the followers or the romantic partner of that person may not be allowed to. And in the early stages, when a person maybe is new to joining a group or new to getting into a romantic relationship where spiritual abuse is present, this may be pointed out to the other person or the group itself. However, there is often a lot of justification on why the leader is allowed to do something or the abusive partner is allowed to do something and the follower isn't. There can be some of those thought stopping techniques that are used where the person is just automatically shut down and told you are not to question me. You are not to question me as a leader. I have the answers. God told me, you know, we go back to that one. But ultimately, that justification and the rationalization does does present itself and this is absolutely a form of spiritual abuse when there are the double standards that are present. The 12th sign is when your perceived shortcomings are completely maximized and the positive traits that you hold are totally minimized. It's almost as if the kindness that you show, how caring you are, totally goes unrecognized and instead all somebody can really focus on is what they perceive to be your shortcomings. Again, it's their perception, what they perceive as your imperfections. This could look like maybe you get a little bit frustrated when you have to wait 
and they take this trait, they take this situation as a fundamental characterological flaw in you. And you start to receive a lot of information on how impatient you are and you need to really trust God and that you need to work through this. It's a hindrance to your salvation. But this is across the board in one-on-one -on -one romantic relationships. This can even happen in family units where the positive traits that you have, instead of those being encouraged and really nurtured, they are almost completely ignored. And the seemingly negative traits that the parents or the romantic partner or the group deem are negative about you are maximized. Of course, that goes into somebody losing sight of the whole person mentality of what they have to offer on the entire scale of who they are. We all have traits about ourselves that could be improved upon. I think it's very, and it's very healthy to kind of know that about yourself, but to be in an environment where your perceived shortcomings, if you will, are the only thing that is discussed and pointed out is a recipe for low self-esteem, insecurity, depression, and anxiety, as well as self-silencing. After a period of time, I've noticed that when people are in these dynamics, whether it is the romantic relationship, whether they grew up in a family situation where this was happening, or it's a religious cultic setting, this really causes a high level of depression, sadness, even self-loathing to occur. And someone can easily internalize the negative beliefs of self that were essentially instilled in them by a group or a religious doctrine that otherwise is supposed to be helpful. So it's a really sneaky, subtle sign of spiritual abuse. The other piece about this is that oftentimes groups obviously don't come out from the very beginning to tell people what's wrong with them and how they're they're flawed and imperfect and just, you know, have all this work that they need to do. Instead, they emotionally get the person invested in the group and then it happens over time. This is the same for romantic relationships. This can even flip on its head in that a trait that the group or romantic partner initially finds attractive about the victim. So let's say that you're originally honored for being such an independent critical thinker can then be held against the person as the control is increased and that original love of how independent you were really becomes a negative piece of who you are for the group. The 13th sign of spiritual abuse that can be sneaky, is very manipulative, is when your religious group or when a romantic partner doesn't consult with you on anything. Instead, they just tell you, this is how it's going to be done. This is what you're going to do. And what this does is ultimately remove the power of choice in that victim. And so they feel, in many ways, can start to feel really stuck that, okay, I guess this is just how it how it's going to be. This is just how my life is going to be as part of this religious group or a part of this romantic relationship and it's another way to silence someone, silence what their needs and their wants are. And so they just suppress what their emotions are, what their thoughts are about something. And it really goes into creating a culture of the uh, abuse of power and a lot of control to be exerted over the victim. This also undermines the victim's power in the situation. So the perpetrator doesn't necessarily see their victim as an equal. And so accordingly, they treat that person as such. So the perpetrator could be an abusive spiritual leader, somebody who's narcissistic or has those narcissistic elements, somebody who just has their own best interests at heart and doesn't take into mind their followers' interests. This could be in the family unit. This could be a romantic partnership where there is that imbalance of power, there's an inequality of power, and this is very much exercised over the victim. There's no consultation, it's almost an order, it's a demand. You will do this, this is how you're going to live, so forth and so on, and it can be very destructive to the person who is going through that particular situation. 
Last but not least, by far large and wide, this is such a common spiritually abusive trait I have seen come up. And this one can be sneaky. I'll get into why it can be sneaky. But if a person is highly image conscious, and when I say the person is highly image conscious, that means you fall under that too. And they tell you that you're a direct reflection of them. And so they have arbitrary expectations on how you're supposed to look, how you're supposed to act, even in some cases, how you're supposed to speak, carry yourself, all of the above, whether or not you can work, things of that nature. And that whatever you do goes into affecting their image. This is very problematic because it almost immediately removes the option to express oneself on an individual level. And instead, you're having to meet these arbitrary expectations of the abusive leader or partner or even family member. The reason that I find this one to be very sneaky, and this is with particular emphasis on romantic relationships, is that in the beginning, the perpetrator of spiritual abuse may phrase something in the way of, oh, I would rather you dress modestly because I really want you to be safe. I want you to be protected. I don't want anybody else to get the wrong ideas about you. Number one, gross. That is such a form of victim blaming. But number two, it comes off again in that pseudo supportive stance. They're looking out for their other half when in actuality, it's a form of control. They are trying to control that other person, what they're putting on their body, how they're expressing themselves, it can go on and on in terms of the measures that somebody puts in place to try to be controlling and have that and meet the needs of their highly image conscious self. Interestingly enough, I found that this really came up when I studied the Rembrandt Church and made the YouTube video on Gwen Lara. If you want to check that video out, please feel free to. I'll link it down in the description below. But Gwen really had a high level of emphasis on her own appearance. We know that she really came to, to the forefront with her dieting techniques. And she really became very controlling, allegedly, according to survivors of her church, regarding how people looked, how they had to be dressed to the nines and they had to be a certain weight or whatever the case could be. And this was just such a demonstration to me of that image conscious mentality that a lot of times individuals who engage in spiritual abuse really put out there. Except again, that sneaky thing without belaboring this point, the sneaky thing is that the reasoning, the rationale, the justification behind why this person is putting so much emphasis on the image that their victim has is often done in a way to exhibit control over their victim and or for some arbitrary reason that goes into meeting the perpetrator's own needs. This list by no means is fully exhaustive. There are so many other signs of spiritual abuse. I'm curious to hear from you. What other signs of spiritual abuse have you seen that have been more so on that subtle, sneaky, underhanded level? The more that we talk about this, the more information can get out there. Thank you so much for watching. If you would like to support my channel, I would love for you to like this video, share it with someone who may benefit. And then please know that you can also purchase mental health merchandise, which is located in the link in my description, where a dollar from every sale is going to be donated at the end of this year to a local foundation slash organization dedicated to providing mental health services to the community. As always, thank you so much for watching and be well.